Hi, this is Kathy McBreen. I'm the president of Millionaire Corner, and I am excited today to talk with Liz Weston. Liz is one of the foremost journalists in the financial media today. She has won, been a part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize. She's also a certified financial planner, which is unlike most journalists who are in this area. She really understands what she's talking about. Um, Liz wrote a book called Your Credit Score, which was very, very popular and was a national bestseller. And now she's introducing a book called Deal With Your Debt. And we're really excited to have her. Liz has been on CNBC. She writes a weekly or monthly column for the Los Angeles Times. She's been on Dr. Phil, and she's been on the Today Show. So I'd really like to introduce you and welcome Liz Weston. Could you talk a little bit first of all about why did you decide to write this book? Well, I was hearing a lot of debt advice that wasn't very good. And what was happening was people was, were following this advice thinking that they were doing the right thing. And a lot of times they were doing exactly the wrong thing for their finances. And a little bit about my background, I went through the certified financial planning mm -hmm. training course. So I knew the principles of comprehensive financial planning. And I knew what these people were missing out on. So I thought, you know what? They need to have the book that gives them the advice that they would get if they could afford a financial planner, mm -hmm. somebody who was objective, somebody who knew these principles and could get those ideas across. So I wanted people to understand that when they took a certain action, it could have long-term effects. Because that's my understanding with most people. They tend to focus on the immediate, and they tend to focus on quick fixes. That's what gets them into debt in the first place, and that's what can make things worse when they try to get out of debt. If they prioritize the wrong things, if they make decisions that are going to reverberate. And one of the examples that I give is a lot of people, once they realize, oh, I'm in debt, they want to throw all their money at it. What they don't realize is if they're not funding their retirement, they're really doing themselves a disservice, and they think they can catch up later. You really can't. Here's the thing about retirement. If you don't get an early start on it, it gets harder and harder and harder to catch up until it's nearly impossible. You know, you could save, say, 10% of your income in your 20s mm -hmm. and continue that and have a comfortable retirement. Well, if you wait till your 30s, you got to up that to 15 or 20%. By the time you're in your 40s, you have to save about a third of your income. Get to your 50s, you're talking about 40%. Most people aren't going to be able to do that. So the important thing is to start saving for retirement early and keep that a priority, even as you're paying down other debt. Mm -hmm. Too often people just say, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'll catch up on that later. Well, you probably won't. And that can really hurt your finances. The other issue that comes up a lot has to do with bankruptcy. I hear from a lot of people who by the time they realize they're really in debt, it's too late for them to fix it. I mean, even if they could devote half their income to paying off their debt, they wouldn't be able to do it. So sometimes bankruptcy is unfortunately the best of bad options, but a lot of people just continue to struggle with this debt and try to pay it down, even though they're going to fail in the long run. And they may throw things like home equity at it or retirement funds, stuff that would have been safe in bankruptcy. They wind up draining it. And what really prompted me to write about that particular part was I got this letter from this elderly couple who had had a lot of medical bills before they'd gotten on Medicare. And the reality was they had thrown every penny at these debts. They had drained their home equity. They had spent all their retirement funds. So now they were in their late 60s. They still had a ton of medical debt, and they didn't have any of those resources for their old age that could have helped them out. So I thought, you know, people really need to know this stuff so they don't make the wrong choices. You know, those are great points. Um, could you talk a little bit about how do I make a decision as to whether a certain debt is something I should work on paying off? I mean, obviously you wouldn't pay all of them off. But when you face the choice of whether or not you should be saving some money or paying off a debt, which are the particular ones that I should focus on trying to pay off as a over saving? Well, here's the thing. Retirement saving has to happen all the time. So that's a priority no matter what. So if you're getting a match at work, you want to at least put in enough to get that company match. And I would argue you need to put in more than that, but that's a minimum. Even if you don't have a match at work, you should be saving 5%, 10%, whatever you can of your income. Get that started and make that a given. Okay. Once that's in place, now you're looking at, all right, do I take money out of my savings, other savings if I have it to pay off debt? That's where the decisions get more complicated. Mm -hmm. But here's the hierarchy in general. You want to target those high rate toxic debts. And by toxic, I mean they're not helping you in any ways. So that's 
credit card debt, payday loans, bounce fees, title loans, anything like that where it's high rate or could be a high rate, even if you've got a teaser right now, that's the stuff you want to focus on paying off. And if you have some savings that's not in a retirement account to pay that off, by all means, you know, maybe put $500 or $1,000 aside and use the rest to pay that. That's a great use of savings because you're making what, you know, 0.25% on your savings, much better off paying that higher rate debt. When you're talking about mortgages, though, or federal student loans, that's the kind of debt you don't want to be in any hurry to pay off. You want to make sure all your other financial ducks are in a row. This is what a certified financial planner would tell you if you could afford to talk to one. And it's the information that a lot of people don't get. And they get all excited about, oh, I'll pay down my mortgage early because I'll save all this money. Well, you have other priorities, typically. You need to be saving enough for retirement. You need to have a decent emergency fund. You need to have all your other debt paid off before you target a mortgage. And you want to make sure that you're properly insured. Most people are going to have all they can do to cover those bases, and they're not going to have any extra money to pay off the mortgage. If you do have all those ducks in a row, though, and want to pay off the mortgage, that's a great idea. But again, you have to do other things first. And similarly with student loans, if it's federal student loan debt that you have, that's actually not a bad debt to have. It's tax, the interest is tax deductible. But more importantly, it has a lot of consumer protections. It has things like income-based repayment if your income should go down and you have trouble paying it. There's a possibility of forgiveness after 10 years if you're a public servant or it's after 25 years if you have any other job. So that makes sure that you won't wind up with massive debts on a low income. Wow, I didn't know some of those things. Yeah, and you know, federal student loan debt is actually very flexible debt. If you need a forbearance or a deferral, you know, if you lose your job, you can do that. That's not something you're going to get with other debts. So, in general, you do want to pay all this debt off eventually, but you shouldn't rush to do it at the expense of those other goals. So, one of the things that I found fascinating in your book, probably because I'm at the point of trying to decide whether I want to remodel my house or continue to have a house or, or or just rent because of you know the cost of property today you know so the opposite of what i learned from my dad who said you always buy a house because it'll always go up in value it really probably doesn't anymore so talk a little bit about in your book how you said for some people having a mortgage is not the right thing that maybe they should rent an economist named robert schiller looked at how houses have appreciated over time and what he found was except for a brief period after world war ii and the recent housing bubble, basically home prices appreciated at about the rate of inflation. And once you factor in all the other costs of owning a home, the repairs, the maintenance, the, the updates, the property insurance, you know, the property taxes, that usually makes it not a great investment. I mean, there are exceptions. In certain areas, you're going to see houses just go crazy. But in general, you know, a house is sort of a, a, something that doesn't necessarily ensure that you're going to get a great return. It's not really an investment. You know, it's a place to live. So the short version is if you want to be a homeowner and you have the money to do so and you can afford it and you plan to stay put for a while, then buying a house can be a good proposition. But it's not the right decision for everybody in all circumstances. If you're young, if you expect to be moving around, maybe renting's a better idea. If you're in a very, very high cost area, sometimes trying to buy a home is just too big of a strain. Maybe you want to wait until you move to a lower cost area mm -hmm. and can actually afford a house to do that. And then at the other end of your life, in retirement, a lot of people find that rental renting is just a better option for them. It gives them more flexibility. It maybe costs less where they live. I mean, it, a lot of these things depend on where you are. But with people on tight incomes, sometimes having a house is just too big a burden, and they might be better, better off in an apartment or another rental situation. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, is, is owning a house sort of like a forced savings? And if you're able to save otherwise... There's no reason to necessarily have to buy a house. Is, is that a good way yeah. to look at it? Well, that's a great way to look at it because there is a forced savings aspect. As you pay that mortgage down, you know, you are building equity over time. I think when our parents saw the, the great increase in the value of their houses, they thought, oh, this is a wonderful investment. Well, there was a lot of inflation during the 70s and part of the 80s, so that's what was propelling those prices. It wasn't necessarily this great investment. It was just rising at the rate of inflation. Your thoughts have been very helpful today, and we really believe our readers and our listeners will have learned a lot. Thank you so much for being with us today.